I'm Jerry Pinckney, a uh, narrative artist focusing on children's books. You know, you, you reach a certain age and, and you begin to start to um, think about what made you, what led you to become the person you are or the artist that I am. In our block, Earlham Street was all African American. Uh, most of the people, our neighbors, um, really migrated from the South. So in a way, we had our own little world. And the necessity to make that world work, as children, we found ways to use kind of what you might call leisure time or spare time in a very inventive way, in a creative way. So we tended to make everything. My father, who was sort of a jack of all trades, and so he worked as a plumber, an electrician, and a carpenter, a painter. And his workshop was in the basement, so we had ample um, uh, tools to work with because we would borrow my father's um, uh, hammers and or screwdrivers and whatnot. So I was always in touch with the idea of using your imagination and, and your hand to create something. Uh, senior year, the Board of Education in Philadelphia would give three scholarships out to art students from all the high schools. And our teacher, who was very fair-minded, felt like a lot of people during the 50s that an African-American couldn't make it in the field. So he actually gave out applications to the white students, but not to the African-American students. And, you know, he thought he was, it was in the best of intentions, he was trying to protect us from a world he thought may not exist for us. So why waste your time? And um, I actually went back down to the um, office and, and got applications. And uh, I was a, made sure that all the students, African-American students, applied. Out of the three um, scholarships that were awarded that year, we got two. Uh, I got one, I received one, and my best friend Warren, African-American, um, uh, received, uh, 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 received the second. The scholarship was to the Philadelphia Museum School of Art, and I chose advertising and design, which was a very pragmatic uh, decision. And I thought also one that I could say to my father that, you know, uh, the reality is in advertising design, I would be able to get some sort of entry level job um, so that there would be some secure future. I loved it, um, but my passions always was it's with printmaking and um, life drawing and and um, and painting. I've never thought of my work in terms of a painter. I mean, I'm a storyteller, and I use drawing and painting to help me tell that story. My earlier books were all folk tales, mainly folk tales, some fairy tales, but. They usually were folk tales that dealt with other countries and other cultures. Textbook people were slow to bring in other cultures. They saw everything through one, one lens. Um, but at the same time, they were looking to explore new ways of, of, of illustrating textbooks. So it was a lot of fun, and this is music dealt with music. Uh, and then I did another uh, um, a series of books on You Can Spell. And it was just interesting because I'm dyslexic, so it was a great, <laughs> interesting series for me to work on. In many ways, the struggle with language has made me hungrier for the, the, the use of language. So I would actually find clients like Franklin Library to take on projects like the classics because in order to get me to that point to illustrate the classics, I would have to read them. It also dovetailed on the 60s and 70s in the Civil Rights Movement and the awareness of the African-American story being told and how it should be told. So they began to start publishing uh, more writers of color and then they sort of followed suit with looking for um, illustrators. Now, I have been working with publishers, so when that turn started to happen, I was there uh, not only to meet their needs, but also to meet my needs. Our children were growing up and were looking for books that would satisfy us in terms of um, uh, seeing people of color mirrored for our children. That was not in place. So I began to look for those projects that would uh, benefit all children, especially African-American children, 
and projects that would also give me a better understanding of the African-American experience and culture. We were taught there were the enslaved Africans, then there was Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth, and there was nothing in between. One of the key things was I wanted to make sure that people understood that the enslaved were individuals that had feelings that one could connect to, uh, and their feelings about not only the hardships or the burdens and the horrific um, experience of slavery, but the idea of, of, of family, you know, the whole concept of um, hard work. What I did so that I wouldn't feel the pain or the wound of being an African American looking at my own history, I tried to do as much research on the history of slavery, period. So slavery worldwide. I could separate myself and look at it as purely a subject. Because being an African American, that's going to come through. Um, so, but I didn't want that piece of, of being feeling wronged or wounded by it. And then you look at when Minty, it was children, American children, and how they were treated during that same period. And the industrial cities in the north, the mills and whatnot, treated children horribly. They were abused and misused and, and used as free labor. And if I put it in the context of what children were experiencing, so certainly slavery was much more difficult and challenging, but at the same point, we weren't, it wasn't the only form of, of abuse of children. So I could be a little bit more objective. Pat McKissick's Going Someplace Special, which is the 50s in the height of segregation in the South. In order to get in emotionally into that project, there were conversations with Pat McKissick about how the signs were placed, where they were placed. And of course, each bus line, each city had a different way of approaching. And she ran through a number of ways that we knew the sign had to be movable, um, be able to move back if, if the white section was too small and they create more seats. So, and she mentioned one um, way of doing it was a, a, a sign on a chain hanging from the top of the bus. And once she mentioned that, I knew that was my way of getting into the story by visually walking under a sign, a degrading sign like that. Black Cowboy Wild Horses as one where the research took on a different shape. It wasn't necessarily going to a library, but I went through the process of finding as many pictures, motion pictures, moving pictures that I could find on Mustangs, which I watched over and over and again. And I also went out of my way to find people who either owned horses or took care of horses to understand the whole language. I've been fascinated with animals um, all of my life on different levels. But when I grew up, again, animals were always caged. The other experience that I had growing up as a child of the inner city was having the opportunity to visit relatives in the country and feel what it was like to see animals in their own habitat. There were both observations about something I was curious about, and I think what you see in my work is it's just about being fascinated with animals in their natural habitat. And there's also this sense that when you look into an animal's eyes, you don't know what they're thinking. So my, what you see in my work is me giving that creature some sense of expression or attitude or posture or something that makes you believe that you understand what's going on. The Lion and the Mouse is a somewhat wordless picture book. For some reason, because I knew the story so well, I thought the, the art was important and it could lead off and help shape a text. But in the process of reworking and reworking, discovered that I was telling the story without words. And then my great-grandchild was fascinated, like all children, with sounds. Um, and I thought, boy, that might be a way of, in a sense, bringing another life or another voice to the book. 
And um, that's when I began to add the sounds um, that you might find on, from the Serengeti and from those creatures. If there was a book that I felt deserved some recognition, it was The Lion and the Mouse. It was succeeding on so many levels. Um, the Caldecott was not necessarily a surprise for me. It was something that I felt the book deserved. Not necessarily that I deserved it, but I felt this book deserved something. My first book was published in 1964, so I mean, I really can look back and see how the, the, the field has, uh, has it's changed and how it's grown, how it's shrunk, and it's, and it's gone through its many, many sort of transformations. There are perhaps less independent space for children's literature than maybe 10 years ago, but there are more books being sold than ever before. It's interesting because uh, we have four children um, and they're all in the arts in, in some shape or form. There is this sense of um, the idea of making things being carried on and I'd like to believe in so many ways that my children and grandchildren saw the pleasure and the hard work that I put into my work and the pleasure that I get out of it uh, to make them believe this is a worthwhile way of um, spending their working life.